It is my special pleasure to introduce our final guest of the night, at least our final speaker. We may have a couple other uh, people who come up with a, a cameo or two. This next man, uh, I can only say, uh, I could go on and on, but there's very few people who've ever faced a felony charge in their lives. Almost no one has faced 24 felony charges in their lives, all right, and beat them all. And even further, he represented himself. And I sat next to him in the trial in Oregon, and the guy did a better job than almost all the other attorneys there. And he beat in, uh, six counts, felony charges in Oregon, by himself, representing himself. I was paralegal. I helped him out a little bit of legal research. Then he beat... Uh, 16 counts plus several forfeiture uh, counts down here in Nevada. And of all the Bundy defendants, Ryan Bundy faced more total felony charges than any other defendant, including Ammon Bundy or Cliven Bundy. He faced more than any of them, and he beat every single charge by himself without an attorney. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the next governor of Nevada, Ryan Bundy. Yeah. started this meeting, you now let me back up just a little bit, you know our founding fathers, they fought a uh, hard and bloody revolutionary war to gain our freedom. And I know that uh, our leader at that point, or one of our leaders, George Washington, didn't do it on his own. He called upon our father in heaven many times. And uh, I believe that we should call on him every time we meet. We have we have failed to do that tonight. I was wondering if we could, yes. even though it might be a bit late for starting out with a word of prayer, it might be a bit early for ending with one. I'm wondering if we could do that. Yes. And uh, instead of me saying it, Raja, would you feel comfortable coming here and saying this? No. We was going to have uh, uh, Victor say the uh, closing invocation. Okay. All right, well, allow me, if you will. Oh, sure. Thank you, Ryan. Father in heaven, we come before thee and we give thee thanks for thy many blessings. We thank thee for this opportunity to meet. We thank thee for the freedom that thou hast blessed us with. We thank thee for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the bravery and freedom that our founding fathers had. To be willing to do whatever it takes to protect our freedom. We thank thee for guiding and leading them. We thank thee for protecting us through all our troubles and trials. And we ask thee that thou would be with us. We are in constant need of thy help. We ask thee that thou would show us the right way to go. We ask thee that thou would lead us. We ask thee that thou would forgive us of our sins. And we might repent. Father in heaven, we love thee. And we're thankful for all that thou hast given to us. In these things we pray and ask for thy spirit to be here with us tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Our water is important. Our land is important. Our resources are important. I know that I have spoken on this subject many times, and maybe you've, you've heard me before. But uh, I want to begin again. I want to talk about the importance of sovereignty. And first of all, show of hands, who understands what that term means? What is sovereignty? There's a few here that don't. Can you give us an answer? What is sovereignty? It's divine individualness given by God. Okay. Sovereignty is, is a divine gift. The sovereignty... He who has sovereignty is in charge. In a kingdom, the king is sovereign. 
In other words, the king makes the rules, whatever he says goes, and everybody else follows. He's the sovereign. He's the only sovereign in that realm. In an oligarchy, which is a rule by an elite group, the elite group are the sovereign. And nobody else in the land has sovereignty. Okay? The buck stops with them. They make the rules. Now, the marvel of America is, is that this is a republic. And the sovereignty is with the people. You, each one of you are sovereign. But did you know that? Okay. Our Constitution begins by laying out the sovereignty, the preamble, states. That we, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States. We, the people, are the sovereign. The United States, speaking of the government, has no sovereignty. You are the sovereign. The state of Nevada, speaking of the government, has no sovereignty. The sovereignty belongs to you. Now, our sovereignty is exercised through the governments that we establish for the protection of our rights. God created man. And God created this earth. And God placed man upon this earth. And he gave man dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, the herbs and the trees, and every creeping thing that groweth upon the, that's upon the earth. And he gave man the commandment to subdue it, to multiply and replenish upon it. And he gave us these lands and resources for our benefit, for our survival, and for our enjoyment. He gave that to man, to Adam, to Eve, he did not give it to governments or groups or corporations. He gave it to individuals. Now, these rights he gave to man. And because man has rights, because man have rights, then we create government to help protect those rights. Our rights do not come from government. Government cannot grant nor take away rights. They might deprive us of them, as what's happening to the Fuentes is here. But those rights are not granted, nor are they taken by government. Now I want to talk about the founding of this country. And I'm going to go back again to our founding fathers. The Declaration of Independence is an amazing document. You should read it often and try to understand what was really taking place. Because they were, they were under such tyranny at the point that they couldn't longer take it. And they, they stated that uh, that experience hath shown that all mankind are more, more disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable. Okay, things can get pretty hard and we can still handle them. But, when, when, uh, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under aspect absolute despotism, it is their right and it is their duty to throw off such governments. Okay, is that taking place here today? Yes. Does it seem like there is a long train of abuses that's taking place? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we've been talking about all night, right? Okay, and doesn't it seem that there's evidence that there is a design to reduce us under absolute despotism? Okay, that's what's taking place. And so, 
when that's the situation, it becomes the right. And even greater than the right, it becomes a duty to abolish that form of government and to replace it with a form of government that will secure our future. And the blood of the old be washed away with the blood of the new. Yes. Yes. Now our founding fathers put forth this declaration and they first of all listed the atrocities that were taking place. And if you read down through this list of atrocities, wow, <laughs> it looks many of the very same things are taking place here to us today. And so they had to do something about it. They had to get tough. They say when times get tough, the tough get going. I know I said that wrong, but. Now, they finished off with saying that with a firm reliance on the protection from the divine providence, promise, we mutually pledge to each other our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. Clyde McBundy said, I'll do whatever it takes. And the government took that as a threat. I wonder if King George took this as a threat. He obviously did. He sent his armies. And that's what happened to us too. They sent their armies to us. At least 200 of them. But our founding fathers, they fought. And again, they didn't fight alone. They fought with the province. Divine promise. And I believe that it was by the power and strength of our Father in Heaven that a little ragtag armies of the United States, and I correct myself there because they weren't the armies of the United States, they were the armies, they were the militia mostly of each individual colony that declared themselves independent, free and independent states. But they were fighting against the greatest, most powerful military force known at that time, the British Army, the British Empire, of which they said uh, the sun never set upon that empire because they had lands all around the world. And yet this little ragtag army was able to prevail. That doesn't happen by accident. That doesn't even happen by strategy. That happens by divine promise. Roger Roots just gave me great accolades, and that didn't happen by my abilities. I had lots of help from others, but mostly I sought and had help from my Father in Heaven. We cannot be free if we do not call upon God. He is the provider of our liberties. And he will be the one who preserves our liberties. We must respect him. Respect his commandments. Now our founding fathers prevailed. And I'm going to read one more part from the Declaration of Independence. Because here is what they really did. With the Declaration of Independence, they listed the atrocities, they listed some um, principles and how um, you know men are created equal and there's some awful good things in there. But the real meat of the Declaration of Independence is the actual declaration. Um, it's in the last paragraph towards the first part of it. And he said, and they say that uh, these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other things which independent states may of right do. Okay, so that's the actual declaration. Before all this, they were called colonies. 
And you see the transition right here in this, in this document. They say we ought to be free and independent states. And from that point on, they are never referred to as colonies again. They're referred to as states. Free and independent states. And they had to back that up with that war. Okay? So what is a free and independent state? What does that mean? To be free and independent. Shall not be governed by anyone else. Shall not be governed by anyone else. That's a good definition. Okay? There's a lot of characteristics that the original 13 states had. And that's one of them. Thank you. But I want to ask, after the Revolutionary War, and it was won by these now free and independent states, how much of the land do you believe that Great Britain retained ownership of within each independent state? It was sold back to them in 1934 as foreign interests. Okay, so say that again. It was sold back to them as foreign interests. That's how we kick-started the Social Security program. Okay, but well we're not talking about later on. I'm talking about right at the... The, the point of winning the war for independence, how much of the land within each state did Great Britain retain? Zero. Zero. It would be ridiculous to believe that we would just fight a war after making this declaration and allow them to retain any, any property there. Okay, so one of the characteristics of the free and independent states now is that all of the land and their resources and other rights, as you mentioned, belong to the state and their people. All of it. Now, our founding fathers intended to unite. But at that point, those free and independent states were separate countries. Again, we talk about definition. What's the definition of a nation? What's the definition of a state? A state is a nation. A nation is a state. And so I would suggest to you with that definition that today this is not one nation under God as we say in our Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, this is not one nation. This is 50 nations currently. Now we are united for common causes and purposes which are outlined in the Constitution for the United States. But we are not one nation, we are 50. At that point, after the Revolutionary War, there were 13 independent nations. Now, proof of this comes in the, the peace treaty that was signed after the Revolutionary War. That peace treaty is called the Treaty of Paris because it was first signed in Paris. So I want to ask, how many states signed that treaty? Does anyone have an answer? No. There were 14. Okay. So we can assume that the 13 original states all signed it. So who would who would have the 14th state been? D.C. D.C. didn't exist. Great Britain. Great Britain. State of Great Britain. Okay, now why is that important? Okay, that is important because... The peace treaty wasn't between two countries. It wasn't between Great Britain and the United States. It was between 14 countries. Each of the new declared and proven through war and blood 13 independent states and the state of Great Britain. Okay? That document alone seems this this 14 signatures on there prove that each one was separate and independent. Okay. Now, it was a, their design to unite, and they first of all did under the Articles of Confederation, and then later they improved that under the Constitution for the United States. The Constitution creates the federal government, it tasks it with certain duties to perform and then enables it with the power to perform those duties. And that's it. And that's what is told 
in the Tenth Amendment. That we the people, the sovereign, delegate some of our authority to a federal government to take care of these certain things. And that federal government is primarily supposed to deal with external affairs, things outside of the Union, to deal with war, with peace, with foreign commerce, with dealings with the other states of the world. It's not supposed to be dealing with the things so much within the states. It's not supposed to come down into the states and to control the states or its people. <clears throat> if we did give it authority to resolve disputes between the states and resolve disputes between members of one state and another state perhaps, but they're not supposed to control the states and they're not supposed to control the people. Okay? The only legitimate function for government on any level is to aid the individual in claiming, using, and defending your rights. And your first and foremost right is your right to life. The second is your right to liberty. The third is the right to pursue happiness, which includes the ownership and control of property. So now let's talk about future states that were made. Our founding fathers can see that there were, that there would be new states coming into, to be formed and could join the Union. And there was a lot of discussion about that. How are these new states going to be formed? There was argument. If you guys read through the uh, Articles of Confederation, I'm sorry, I'm getting off. Read through the um, Federalist Papers. If you read through the Federalist Papers, you can start to see their argument, start to see what they were trying to discuss. You can, you can figure out their original intent. They had a lot of discussion upon these new states. What are these new states going to be? Some of them wanted to say, oh, all the new states are going to be subservient, or they're not going to be as, as great as, they're going to be less than these original states. That way these original states maintain some, some power. But no, you're right. He's shaking his head. No, no. Okay, because there was there was some of the, the founders who said, if these states are not equal in every way, then either they will not join the Union, or they will quickly revolt from it. They were granted the supremacy clause. Okay. They these the equality of the states, they had to be equal. They had to be equal or or it just wouldn't be right. Now they didn't want these new states to become greater than and so therefore they made some parameters and, and size and, and a few things like that. But, um, but when it was all said and done, each new state was supposed to be equal in every way to the original 13 states. In all their rights and privileges. So now when we talk about land ownership again, we're talking about... How much land did the Great Britain retain? Zero. Zero. So how much land can the federal government own within, within a new administrative union? Zero. 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 All right. Now, these lands that were acquired, and there were several different acquisitions of land uh, across the, the continental America. Uh, you know, they, they had some land that we called the Northwest Territories. Um, that land was also already claimed by some of the, the, the original 13 states. They relinquished claim on that land to allow it to be uh, turned into new states. So that was the first. And then we have some other acquisitions uh, from, from Spain where we got Florida and some of those southern portions of the country. We had the Louisiana Purchase. Um, Texas came in. Um, and of course we had the Mexican-American War. Um, which ended up in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is what acquired these lands that were on. And then, of course, there was the Oregon Territory. There was a couple other small ones that took in a few pieces of ground. But this new territory, this new land, they were not states as of yet. And so our founding fathers put in, a, uh, in Article 4 of the Constitution 
that Congress can make the needful rules and regulations respecting those territories, but also that they had the right to dispose of those territories. In other words, back to the Tenth Amendment, if we did not give the federal government right to do something, then they don't have it. Is that what the Tenth Amendment says? Yeah. So, has anyone read within the Constitution any place where they have the right to retain land? It's also under the Tenth Amendment. Yes, correct. Ports. Okay. Ports. Ports. Well, let me go through that. I'll go through that in just a second, right here. You're right on, right on line. Thank you. Okay, so the federal government, we did not give them authority to retain land. They only had authority to dispose of it. And dispose of it means to get rid of it. So these territories, they can make the needful rules and regulations on it, but if they have to get rid of it, then we know that that's a temporary situation. Temporary. It doesn't necessarily give timelines, but we know that it's temporary. They have to dispose of it. And so the, the means and methods of disposal are, first of all, they can sell it. And they can give it away. We know that there was uh, such acts, acts as the uh, uh, Homestead Act. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a method of disposal. But the ultimate method of disposal is turning it into states. Okay. And once a land becomes a state, everything changes. It's no longer a territory. They no, Congress no longer has authority over it. It now belongs to the people of that state as a sovereign state, as a sovereign people. And 100% of the land and the resources belong to the people in that state. Now, you mentioned that the federal government can own military bases, forts, and ports. And we, if you've ever, I know that you guys know the Bundys. I, I, I may be preaching to the fire, and you may be tired of hearing this stuff. But uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, allows the federal government to petition the state legislature for the purchase of land, which then can be used for military bases, arsenals, dockyards, magazines, and other needful buildings. And that's it. Let me ask you, is there any place within the Constitution that allows the federal government to own or control water? No. no. What's going on here, I wonder? Yeah. Unconstitutional. That's right. Okay. They're breaking the law. They're breaking the law. Now, Nevada has some good water laws. And if I understand right, Nevada water engineer is standing behind the Fuentes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Partially. Yeah, partially, and we're working the rest of that out, I understand. Actually, hoping to raise money for a water court litigation. Wow. And see, I wonder, is it really necessary that we should go no. through court? No. 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 Isn't the documentation and the history yes. enough? Yes. yes. Since when do we need someone else to make another decision on it? No. Nope. Is there any decision to be made at, at all, being that there is no constitutional right for the federal government to own, uh, control water? Exactly. No. Okay. Where's the question? There is none. Exactly. Okay. Why shouldn't this dam be taken out first thing in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Here, here. It was up to me, that's where I'd be. But this is the Fuentes property, and they have to make that decision. But if you do, you need a piece of equipment. I've got an excavator. Amen. I'll bring it up. We'll stand behind you. But I'll let you make that decision. Now, I'm running for governor. And I do this because I understand the proper form of government. And I understand the proper purpose for government. And that throughout the years that we have dealt with 
these atrocities of the federal government coming down upon us. We have time and time and time again petitioned our local elected officials to uphold their oath of office, to protect our life, our liberty, and our property. We have noticed them, legal constructive notices, several times. We have said, please, please uphold our rights. I can tell you that you only have rights that you claim. You only have rights that you use, and you only have rights that you defend. If you do not do all three, then you will lose your right, or not have one at all to begin with. You can't have a right you don't claim. You don't claim it, I guess you don't want it. It's not yours. You must not have a right. If you don't use it, well, if you have a right but you're not using it, well, I guess it's no value to you, and therefore you must not want it. And if you don't defend it when the time is right, then you will lose it because you don't defend it. And the Fuentes is here, they claim their rights. They use their right, and they're in the process of defending their right, but I'm also warning them that they need to put it back to use. Because if they don't, they might lose it on that premise. I'm ready to bring up the sign. You've all seen the, 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 the photographs or the, the signs that show the red versus the white with the federal ownership and uh, where it shows that uh, the federal government owns roughly or claims to own roughly 90% of the state of Nevada. Well, when I'm governor, I will correct that. This is Nevada land, and people will be welcome to come here and to enjoy it, and this will be done by the people. BLM signs will come down, yes. Nevada signs will go up, yes. okay? And, and I'm not gonna ask their permission. <laughs> situation as to the, the Fuentes is here. 
the federal government tromped upon their water rights and other rights until they couldn't they couldn't get them they couldn't get them to cave and so finally they used criminal prosecution to take them out and that could happen to the Fuentes here because we can see they've already diverted the water to try to drought drought them out and yet these men the Fuentes and his wife they're tough people and I thank them for standing but the court systems are using lies, manipulations, false evidence, withholding evidence, false accusations. And it's not just the federal courts, by the way, it's the state courts too. Yes. They're denying people of their right to be uh, innocent until proven guilty. They're denying them of their rights to speedy trial, denying them right to fair trial. Denying them right to public trial. Using color of law. Using color of law. Denying their right to trial, a jury trial. And these things are going to have to be corrected. Yes, sir. I do believe that is a sheriff's responsibility. You bet you it is. And while I was in Nye County, because I spent a year, and my father spent nearly two years right here in Nye County, and I called the county sheriff myself from jail. Of course, they wouldn't let me speak to her. And then they threw me in the hole for making the call. But there are atrocities going on right in this county where men's rights are being trampled on. And yes, you're right. It's the county sheriff's responsibilities to protect the rights of all its citizens, all its people, and if those people are being housed there, then they're part of your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when a man calls, even from a jail cell, the county sheriff better respond. Yeah. Here, here. And so I appreciate how you were speaking earlier. And, uh, and, and stand up, <coughs> tell us your name. I'm Jerry Butler, I'm running for sheriff in Nye County. And you promise to be a constitutional sheriff? I, Supreme, uh, the supremacy clause is that I have to. It's, it's the only thing that grants me the right to be a sheriff. Okay. Amen. Amen. Is our current Nye County Sheriff here tonight? I, I understood that she was going to come. I, I was hoping that she would be here. Yeah, the DA is back there. Okay. Oh, that's good. So who is the DA? Thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Prosecutions of men who have not committed crimes needs to be stopped. Okay. Because I, I witnessed over and over again. I experienced it myself, and I witnessed other men who are are placed in jail, who are accused of crimes they didn't commit, who are many times coerced through uh, through pressures, and then they make plea deals whether they're guilty or they're not. Either that, or maybe if they have committed a crime, a small crime, that it's a, a, a molehill has turned into a mountain. Okay. Now, when a man commits a true crime, when he's actually done harm to another person's life, liberty, or property, then he should be forced through the courts of law and through prosecution to repair that damage. But that there is, if there is no harm done and there was none intended, then no crime has been committed and there needs not be prosecution. Here, here. Yeah. The definition of crime can only be that one, a man or woman, I use that term man meaning mankind, 
when a man has intentionally, purposely done damage to another man's life, liberty, or property, otherwise violated his rights, and no other thing is a crime. I intend to make sure that that's part of the definition written in the state constitution, and that prosecutions be stopped. It's a terrible burden upon people be prosecuted and persecuted and feed and find when there's been no crime. And we're dying in there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't want this to be a campaign speech. I come here to talk and teach about principles and to support the Fuentes and to get, lend them support because I do care and I'm concerned about your rights. And I can see that this place was beautiful. Was. Past tense. And that I can see that the waters that run through here, once they run through here, they still ended up in the same reservoir that they do now. Okay? So what purpose was the government trying to accomplish other than drought the Fuentes is out. Power and control. Okay. Well, I just like to say because this is very important that under the Tenth Commandment, what he, uh, uh, Tenth Amendment, what he was talking about is the supremacy clause. It says that the Constitution is the supreme authority within the land. All laws, federal, state, county, any of them, even the count, uh, state Constitution, is subordinate to the uh, is subordinate to the Constitu uh, the U.S. Constitution. And any laws that do, are written under it are null and void. Okay, so and that's yeah. actually under Article 6 of the Constitution, and Clause 2, yeah. and it states that this Constitution and all the laws that are made in pursuance thereof, the pursuance thereof this Constitution, right. shall be the supreme law of the land. There's, it's also under the Article of Confederation, which you mentioned earlier, too. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I know my speech is getting long and boring, so I'm going to bring it into this. But is, uh, first of all, is there any questions? Does anyone under, have questions for me about maybe what happened in Oregon or what happened in 2014 or anything about uh, my principles? Anyone have any questions for me? With all you've been through and what you see the Fuentes are going through, can you see how the outside something we don't that we didn't do? Yeah, that's a good question. Here with the Fuentes? Yeah, get the excavator. Well, I'm not, I'm not kidding about that either. You know, the, the county sheriff, okay, he, he, think about it this way. And I, and I uh, Madam DA, um, what, is your, what is your name? Just like Angela. Angela, okay, Angela. If, if any other man were to do this same sort of thing in, in any other part of the county, just go in and, and take the rights of them, that would be cause for prosecution against someone of that sort. Would that not be correct? If they trespass on someone's land? No, if they come and they rob their water rights like this. Yeah. It has to be asked, activated by the sheriff himself first okay. and then sent to her. He has to do the report. And if, if, I, if I went mm -hmm. down into Perunk, and diverted the water out of Mr. Hafen's well so he couldn't water his fields. <laughs> Good. Perhaps. That sounds like a criminal act to me if you're rob robbing someone else's property. Water is necessity well, for life. They stopped the water on the, it was in their land and it was flowing to the next property. <laughs> I know. I don't want to. Get, I know we're getting a little crazy here. Yeah. 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 Well, my point was. Well, I guess we're getting a little down into into the details. But uh, if if someone had a a clear right and title according to the state water rights and water, and 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 then they they diverted it, that that's. That's taking something that doesn't belong to them. That's theft. Might not be robbery. Robbery is done with force, um, but it certainly is theft. And theft is a crime. Right. And if any other exactly. man were to do that, exactly. now I know that there's, you know, when we when we talk about watershed laws mm -hmm. and different things like that, 
in most, you know, a lot of waters that one man has right to, you know, begins on other properties sometimes and uh, through runoff and, and so forth. Uh, most of our diverted water oftentimes starts some other place and that we, but we have diversion rights and uh, right of ways this for water, ditches. This water ran through here since 1871. It's the same exact place it always ran. Yeah. And so what I see going on here is that there is a crime taking place yes. and yet it has gone unaddressed. Okay. has gone unaddressed by the those in authority to protect those rights which would be fall on the county sheriff okay now the Fuentes need to make a claim that they have been harmed and that claim needs to be filed with the DA here and then that DA can take it up but she can't take it up if you don't make that claim so that needs to take place if it hasn't yet. And then those criminals need to be held accountable and the rights need to be wrong, or the wrongs need to be right, righted. And that water needs to be headed back down here. And it's as simple as that. And if you were to go up there and to open that ditch and send that water back down here, you'd be well within your rights because you have right to that water. As long as that is correct with the state engineer and, and recorded properly. The claims made, if it's not, that's another story. And you need to make beneficial use of it. Where, where is the state engineer's stand on this right now? I don't know. Yeah, I know that there's still some questions and they're working with that, and I, anyway, so I can't answer that question from here. Anyway, um, I believe in Nevada. I believe in freedom. And I'm running for governor because those who are currently in and have been for the last 25, 30 years have failed to uphold my rights, my father's rights upon the land. To the point that they allowed us to be prosecuted in a federal court unjustly. I spent two years in prison right here in this county for a big part of it. My rights were not listened to by the county sheriff here. My governor did not stand up for my rights. My attorney general, Adam Laxalt, failed to stand up for my rights. If their duty is to protect my life, liberty, and property, then where are they? AWOL, protecting their own. Okay, where are they? Filling their pockets. <laughs> if I can count on them to protect my life, liberty, and property, then I will step out of the race. Because i got better things to do. I want to live my life. I want to build the ranch and enjoy my children and teach my kids how to work and enjoy life a little bit. But I can't. I can't count on them. And so I feel compelled to step in this position. And besides, you know, everyone keeps thinking that, oh, the Bundys have won. And we have, for the large part. But there's still a man over there in that jail in Parump named Todd Engel. Who was with us there that day on the bridge in 2014 who did not commit a crime who is setting in incarceration right now For what? well because of the lies and the manipulations that the government prosecutors yeah. use withholding evidence and and this and the judge disallowing true evidence to come in he was convicted by a jury Falsely. Yes, falsely. That's where I just went with all of that. Okay. But he's not guilty. The jury couldn't make an informed decision. And quite frankly, a jury that... There's a big problem with people. The jury's supposed to ensure that they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The problem is, is they're not told they're lied to. Weren't they misled? 
was and everything? The jury was misled? The jury was misled, and so then they make a conviction. But that's what happens in most of these cases. I've seen it over and over again. I experienced it. And it was only by the grace of God that I was able to get through. When the government has a 98% conviction rate, and yet little old me here, rancher from southern Nevada, is able to beat 24 federal felony charges, that doesn't happen by accident, nor does it happen by my own wit and skill. That is the work of our Father in Heaven. But he's not the only man over there. There's other men that are incarcerated in that jail in this very county that are being denied their rights, such as Omar Kazi, who's being falsely accused of some crimes, and he's been in that facility now for 40 months without being tried. No trial. And then there was the man, John Michael Edwards. I don't know exactly how old he was, about 80 or so. And he stayed in that prison right there in Crump for eight and a half years without going to trial until he died this week. Okay, that's one of the rights that's being denied, the right to a speedy trial. And yet, our county sheriff should go over there and shut that facility down. Because of the atrocities that are being taken place. There is no court, there is no judge, there is no group of people that can rightfully do these things. And so I feel compelled to run for this governor seat. I, I, I lay awake at night and I worry about these men that are incarcerated. I lay awake at night and I worry about our freedoms, yours and the Fuentes' and others. I worry about the Hammonds. And I pray and I say, Father, what can I do? A lot of people look to me and say, oh, you're so great. You went through all these cases. You must know all kinds of stuff. Please help me. Please help me. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. But when I pray, the answer came, run for governor. I'm like, I don't really want to. <laughs> But I finally listened to him and decided to sign, sign up. And, and I really don't know how to run a good campaign. I just soon go to work, <laughs> build the ranch, put some waters in, try to get some cows fat. I just want to live and let live. I just want to be free and be left alone. That's all I want. I just want to live in peace. It's I'm about peace. It's not the time. You can't. I know. It's not That's the why time. I'm here. None of us can. It's not the time. I just want peace. I just want peace. That's all I want. You know, the Bundys, we didn't try to get where we're at. We just wanted to live and be let alone. They attacked us. They attacked us. But we studied and we understood the Constitution, we understood the, our rights, we understood the proper form and function of government, and, and we just said, no, we're not going to bow down to the tyranny, and we'll do whatever it takes to maintain our liberty. We'll do whatever it takes. We just said what our founding fathers said. And yet, um, they attack us, they try to kill us. And I will tell you, let me just tell you, I know maybe some of you guys have heard this already before, but before they attacked us in 2014, I had a telephone conversation with a BLM special agent, Michael Johnson. And Michael Johnson, on a telephone call, told me, he goes, 
This will be the next Waco or Ruby Ridge. And we will kill you. Wow. Wow. And that's his government. Okay. I said, all right, come on. <laughs> that was 10 or, you know, that was 10 days or so before they, they showed up. I knew going in what their intentions were. And we were alone. But we fought, we but then people started to come. And then those militias came. And I want to give all the people who came some praise and thanks. Yes. Because one of the testimonies in our trial by one of the DLM agents were Oh, they said, we weren't so scared of the guns. It was the numbers of people that showed up. We weren't expecting that. But I can tell you that that was a grand example of peaceful assembly. It was a grand example of the proper use of the Second Amendment. And that... The proper use of the Second Amendment saved our lives. And not one shot was fired. You gotta be willing to stand. Because people, if you expect to be ignorant and free, you expect what never was and never will be. And this form of government was designed for a moral and religious people. Yeah, here, here. And it is wholly inadequate for any other. And if we do not listen and seek the guidance of our Father in Heaven and try to keep His commandments and ask for forgiveness and repentance when we break those commandments, then He will not support us. And if we want to be free, we better turn to our Father in Heaven. And that's how we will obtain freedom. So I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.